Okay. Well, let me welcome today's speaker, Tom Beeks. I think many of you will know Tom, but if you don't, Tom is a trainer at the Bell Foundation, and he's worked in language education since 2003, having taught in countries around the world. Um, he's particularly interested in international education and teacher development. And you may also know that Tom helped create the Bell Foundation's Language for Results International suite of online courses. And he also works as an assessor on our ALFRI accreditation scheme. And in today's webinar, Tom will explore translanguaging and will present practical ideas for using students' own languages to enhance their learning. If you've got any questions during the webinar, feel free to put them in the chat. I will be collecting them and I will post them to Tom at the end. And in the next couple of days, uh, we'll send out an email with a recording of the webinar. So don't worry if you miss something or you, if you have to leave early. And we will also send out any links or resources that Tom will be mentioning during the webinar. So again, don't feel that you have to note everything down. It will all be including, included in the email that we'll be sending out. But now, without further ado, I'll pass over to Tom. Thank you very much, Arka. Um, It's wonderful to see so many people here um, to talk about translanguaging, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah, a big welcome. And um, if you do have any questions or comments as we go, please add them to the chat. Um, we've got a lot to get through, um, so I hope there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, but uh, please do put your questions in there. And if we can't get through them today, maybe we can uh, address them in a future webinar. OK, so our learning intentions, what we're planning to do today is to have a look at a definition for translanguaging in a school context. Um, it's one of those words, isn't it, that I'm sure you've seen used a, a lot, and it's often got um, a lot of different definitions and understandings. We'll try and clarify that for you. We'll look at a framework for how you might implement translanguaging in a more strategic way. Um, and we're going, we are going to look at some practical activities as well for how to use students' own languages to help them learn. Okay, and that's learn both content and develop their English as well. Um, and we're also going to look at how translanguaging might look different in different contexts. So different kinds of um, multilingual classrooms you're working in, whether or not the teacher uses the home language of, of the students and things like that. Um, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll feel you can make more informed choices about using different translanguaging strategies and hopefully you can implement some of those and your learners are better able to access learning um, by using all of their linguistic repertoire. So we're going to start with a seemingly simple question, but one that is actually surprisingly slippery. You know, what is translanguaging? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this just so we've got a little bit of clarity. So I did a lot of reading about this, um, and I'm sure if, you've, if you have read anything about translanguaging, a lot of the definitions are very kind of long-winded and quite academic. Um, so I kind of distilled it down to this as, as one part of my definition, which was using all the linguistic tools available to students to help them learn more effectively. Um, but I think this is slightly incomplete, as we'll see. What I mean by that is, when we think about translanguaging, it's really important to point out that few, if any, of the practices we're going to talk about today are new. Okay, A lot of people think of translanguaging as this new, exciting thing, but using students' own languages has been around for as long as multilingual classrooms have been around. Teachers and students have been switching between languages to help teach and learn forever. Um, although the degree to which that practice is condoned or has been done intentionally has varied over time. Um, and I think what does make translanguaging distinct is that it comes from a particular perspective or worldview. So I'm going to contrast um, what translanguaging is by putting it against what it is not. So I think if we look at uh, late 20th century or early 21st century multilingualism in the classroom, and attitudes towards it, I think having lots of languages in a classroom was often viewed either negatively or, or kind of neutrally. You know, it was 
it was a problem to achieving learning. It was seen as a barrier. Um, and we can see that represented by uh, what we call deficit language. Um, people saying things like, oh, that student's extremely EAL, or he's got severe EAL, or the student has insufficient language. This is kind of deficit way of thinking. And this meant that own language use was often at best tolerated and in many cases actively policed. Um, and by that I mean actively discouraged or with learners even being punished for using their own languages at school. Um, and English only school and classroom policies are still fairly common, I think, um, and are often assumed to be best practice. Although hopefully today we'll look at why that may not be the case. Um, and as a result of these practices, English is often seen or was often seen as the only available tool for learning. It was the only effective or acceptable medium. Um, and not just English, it's important to note, but usually it was an idea of a particular unchanging standardized form of English, usually from an Anglophone country um, such as British English or North American English. Um, and again, other minoritized or non-standardized varieties of English are often, uh, not always consciously, sometimes unconsciously, often excluded from this definition. So this is what I think were often prevailing views in the past. And what we see with the um, introduction of translanguaging as an idea in schools is that it comes along with this shift in thinking and a shift in attitudes. And I think that's really what makes it um, new, if you like, or, or a, it's, to, it's the ideology behind it. So we move from multilingualism as a barrier to viewing it as an asset for learning and for living. So that means we believe in the benefits of multilingualism and recognize that it's the normal state for the majority of people on the planet. The truth is, if you're monolingual, you're a bit weird. You're actually, that's not how most people live in this planet. Um, it's also at the school level, viewing multilingualism, not just through the lens of validating home languages, but of giving them equal weight in the structures and practices of the school. And that leads us to the idea that own languages or home languages or heritage languages, however you refer to them in your context, should be recognized and valued and celebrated. And again, especially minoritized languages and language varieties, because typically we're quite good at schools. At, we're quite good at as school picking, bigging up or recognizing those globally important high status languages. So Mandarin, Spanish, Arabic, French, German, but maybe we're less good at recognizing and celebrating uh, less widely known languages. Um, Tagalog, where's Gujarati or Yoruba or Berber or Jamaican Patois. So translanguaging means valuing them all the same understanding that they're all of equal value, even if they're not always of equal status. And that means that we believe that all parts of a student's language repertoire can be harnessed for learning and effective communication. And also this idea that they're kind of fluid and they could be mixed together. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about what that looks like or how to facilitate that as we go through the webinar. Um, so I think these are the main ideas behind trans languaging. So let's try to have another try at defining it. So we have this as the first part, but I think we need to add a little bit more to it like this. So using all the linguistic tools available to students to help them learn more effectively, because we believe that recognizing, valuing, and making use of all languages and language varieties will strengthen and benefit our school community. This is just my attempt at trying to make the term translanguaging a bit clearer for people working in a school context. Okay, this is not um, a dictionary de definition. This is my own idea, but hopefully this is what I'm working with today. So this is, this is how I'm thinking of translanguaging. So you're probably thinking, Dom, okay, great. What does it actually look like? Um, so I think we can, um, first of all, make the observation 
that translanguaging can either be spontaneous or it can be planned. So we'll have a look at what spontaneous translanguaging might look like. So one example might be students and teachers switching between languages during classroom discourse um, in discussions or writing tasks, um, giving instructions. So here I'll show you an example of a child's utterance. So the child says, ah, so, 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 sorry, woge confused the la ano wo mintien bring you la okay hama. Um, apologies for my uh, Mandarin pronunciation. But what's happening there is the child is using Japanese discourse markers. They're using Chinese grammatical particles and pronouns, and they're using some keywords in English. Um, and Li Wei, the academic who talks a lot about translanguaging, makes the point that a child speaking like this isn't doing this in a pre-planned way. They're not thinking, okay, now I'll switch to English. Now I'll sp switch to Chinese. It's happening naturally because the speaker feels it's the most effective and natural way to communicate. Um, maybe because they lack the words for some things. Maybe it signals social connection to the person they're talking to. Uh, maybe it's a way of easing the cognitive load as they're talking. So if we think of translanguaging like this, if we're insisting that a student only uses a single language for communication for our plurilingual children, this might be actively unhelpful because we're preventing them from properly expressing themselves. Uh, if they've grown up speaking multiple languages, they are naturally going to mix them together. So this is the essence of plurilingualism versus multilingualism. So this idea of the languages are all interwoven in the ways that work best for us. So that's what spontaneous spoken translanguaging might look like. But in writing, it might look something like this. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. In this example, you can see that a child has um, been using the home language in their illustration. And this is a, an example shared with permission from an EAL teacher called Jessica Davis, who kindly shared this with me. And you can see that the child is writing their, what they've done at the weekend in English, but in their drawing of their family, the family members are speaking in Korean. So again, this wasn't something that the child was instructed to do. It's just something they've naturally done um, because they're comfortable representing other languages uh, in, their, in their schoolwork, which I think is great. Other ways that spontane spontaneous translanguaging might um, manifest in your classroom are things like clarifying instructions or explanations. This could be from a teacher or, com or from students. Uh, on the spot translation. So obviously with devices now, we do a lot of things with um, online translation tools or things like Google Lens. Um, it could be making spontaneous cross-linguistic comparisons or cultural and personal connections. So just asking questions like, how do you say that in your language? Or hmm, does your language work like that? Um, building those connections and awareness of the similarities and differences between each other's languages. And I think this can be looked at as a type of co-learning between the teacher and the learners. So the teacher and the learners are learning from each other. The teacher's not necessarily the expert in the child's own languages. Um, and this is something we should acknowledge and exploit because we know how much children love the chance to be the expert on a topic compared to the teacher or you know, or another adult or, or other children. So I think in our multilingual classrooms, you know, we can really leverage that to improve the curiosity and awareness of languages. And this can happen quite spontaneously. But let's look at the planned, what planned translanguaging might look like um, and here's a list um, provided from a again some research um, done by uh, Jung Feng Tian and Li Wei in their recent paper so most of these are quite self-explanatory 
and often common practice in EAL support. Um, and I'll talk later in a bit more detail about how we might exploit some of these strategies um, in a bit more depth. For other examples of planned use of translanguaging, um, I recommend you watch the webinar we did a couple of years ago with Eowyn Chrisfield, um, and I'll share a link to that um, after the webinar with you. Um, but we can see that a translanguaging classroom will likely contain both planned and spontaneous elements. Um, but it's worth asking ourselves why this might actually be useful and what the benefits are. And I think this is an important question to ask when thinking about translanguaging. So we can identify four key benefits um, according to the research that's around at the moment. Um, first of all, there are linguistic benefits. Um, and the evidence and research on this at the moment is quite light because translanguaging um, in the way that we've just been discussing it is quite a new phenomenon. And so there's not a lot of formal research around it at the moment. The research there is seems to come mainly from tertiary education. And what they found is that the linguistic benefits are in things like memorizing new vocabulary, understanding usage and grammar, um, the deepening of genre conventions, uh, sorry, the deepening of understanding about genre conventions for academic writing. So, you know, understanding how different types of academic writing look like and sound like. Um, and also when used for planning academic writing, the research suggests that actually the quality of the English writing compositions improves when um, translanguaging is used in the planning process. Um, as I said, a lot of that research is from kind of university level. I imagine a lot of it could apply quite nicely to a secondary level. I don't know how relevant it is in primary. Um, but we can also look at the other benefits. So there are also cognitive benefits. And if done well, I think translanguaging provides greater access to content because we might be providing translated texts or own language materials or own language explanations by teachers or peers. Um, so we're building that, that knowledge and understanding. There are cultural benefits. Um, it in increases cultural awareness and cultural knowledge. As we know, language and culture are inseparable. So when we start mixing them up and noticing the similarities and differences and comparing them, um, it's natural that we also start noticing cultural differences and, and that kind of spontaneously happens in the classroom. And I think that's always a beautiful thing when it happens. We can also see socio-emotional benefits. Um, and this is around cultivating students' positive identity, their sense of belonging, and promoting greater participation and engagement with their peers and their family than might otherwise be the case if we were only operating in one language. Um, and I think on that basis, translanguaging really needs to become part of the discussion on equity and inclusion in your school. Um, if it's not already. And it's definitely something that should be discussed um, in whole school language policies, for example. Okay, so um, for all the reasons we've just discussed, um, translanguage is quite complex and it's not something you can just walk into your classroom one day and start doing translanguaging. Um, or if you do do that, I think it's less likely to be successful. So we're going to look at a framework for how you might implement translanguaging in a more strategic kind of way that hopefully will benefit your students in, in the most um, effective way. So I'm going to give sort of four main points and we'll talk through them in a bit more detail. The first thing when it comes to translanguaging is laying the foundations. Um, this idea took from um, the recent book by Peter Clements and Adrian Schlappach, which is uh, about supporting EL learners. And they talk about the importance of, of laying foundations. And what they mean is understanding your context and then planning and preparing to introduce um, translanguaging strategies. So preparing your learners and also potentially teachers as well is going to be really important. And we'll look at that in a moment. 
you then need to choose the appropriate strategies as we've talked about different classrooms will have different needs different students will have different needs different not all strategies will work in all contexts and then of course we need to do them and monitor and refine those and again there isn't any research yet on what works so it's up to you <laughs> experiment figure it out refine we haven't got a lot of time to go into that element today but something for you to think about when you're doing it in your school all right so let's talk about laying the foundations um so our starting point the um the trench if you like in which we're laying our foundations is finding out about the linguistic landscape of your school and your classroom so this means that we need to understand the following things um, first of all staff student and parent attitudes towards own language use um, ideally this would be something that is led by your school leadership um, it could involve questionnaires working groups staff meetings um, pupil and parent groups could also be used to get a sense of the attitudes within those groups it's going to be really important to understand and collect information on the language profiles of your students. You won't be able to use translanguaging effectively unless you have a very clear understanding of the mix of languages spoken by the students in your lessons. Hopefully the school already has this data. International schools are usually pretty good at collecting this. Um, but if not, it's pretty simple to create a short questionnaire for your parents or carers or students. Um, I was at a conference yesterday and a head teacher was talking about uh, his school. He got his parents to share a celebratory biography of their children, which included like things like their likes and hobbies, their achievements, but also their languages. Um, and, you know, parents love um, um, talking about the achievements of their children. So he, he took advantage of those proud parental instincts um, and he got loads and loads of information. Um, apparently a couple of parents even set up a website about their children to share information. So, you know, there are ways of getting this information if you don't have it. Um, and the other thing you'll need to think about is a class and teacher profile. So this refers to the makeup of the multilingual learners within the classroom and whether or not they share a home language with the teacher. And one really useful way to think about this is to identify what type of multilingual classroom you work in. And so I'm going to introduce you to this idea of three different types of multilingual classroom that might help us choose translanguaging strategies. And this analysis comes from Philip Kerr and his um, excellent book, Translation and Own Language Activities. It's got lots of great ideas, and I'll be drawing on a lot of them in this webinar. Um, according to this categorization, then, we've got three types. Classroom A is where the teacher doesn't share the language of the pupils or doesn't share a single language with all of the students. Um, and also there is no shared single language between all of the pupils, although there may be small pockets who share a language. Um, this is pretty common in, um, I think, a lot of international schools where there's a really multilingual cohort. Um, especially in those very international locations, um, places like uh, Switzerland or, or Dubai or things where there's oft places where there's often a lot of um, different nationalities. It's also what we see in a lot of multilingual classrooms in national systems like in the UK and, and the United States or Australia. Classroom B is where the teacher doesn't share the language of the pupils, but the pupils themselves generally share a language or languages. So this might be a, a like an international school where the vast majority of the students come from the local community, but the teachers are recruited internationally. And classroom C is where the teacher shares the same language with the pupils and the pupils themselves all share a language or languages. So again, we might see this in kind of bilingual international school settings. Um, it's particularly common in, I think, places like China and Asia, where they may not, um, for whatever reason, be recruiting teachers from um, overseas. So they're recruiting local teachers, um, even though it's an English medium environment. Um, and so the teachers will also share the home language and the community language of the pupils. So um, I'm interested to know, just briefly, um, what type of school or classroom rather you work in 
Um, so if you want to have a look and sort of just put AB in the chat, just so we can get a sense. Of course, some of it, these are not black and white. There may well be shades in between. <laughs> so I'm just curious. So we've got some A's and B's and a couple of, okay, interesting. B and C, A and B, absolutely. And it's possible for there to be more than one type of classroom within the same school as well. It's really important to note that. Excellent. Okay. Ah, cool. Okay, so there's a really, there's a sort of broad mix, but it does seem like sort of A and B are kind of predominating there. Um, and we'll come on to why that might be important as we talk about our strategies. So once we've laid our foundations, then um, there's also this element of preparing our students kind of mentally and psychologically more than anything for doing trans languaging. Um, and this could involve a number of things. One of the things I would say is really important, especially from the perspective of school leadership, is creating opportunities for planning um, between teaching staff. So um, and also opportunities for planning translanguaging intentionally into your curricula and schemes of work. So if you're a school leader, you might want to ensure staff have opportunities to do this. Um, this might include making staff aware of the types of planned translanguaging that occur, um, helping them to integrate those ideas into their planning processes. Um, and I would just say, remember the three C's, uh, collaboration, collaboration, and collaboration. Um, all of the international schools that I see or, or the, any school I see that is successful in its EAL provision, um, implementing things like translanguaging, they have some kind of um, collaboration happening between their EAL specialists and their classroom or subject teachers. So they are managing to find ways to work together to learn from each other. Um, and this is really uh, powerful. Um, and it's also really impactful and free CPD for the staff as well, because they both learn from each other when they do these things. The other thing we, we need to create are these shared expectations. So both staff and students need to share expectations around what own language use looks like in our school, in our classroom, and the behaviours that we expect to see around it. So again, this could happen at the whole school level with our languages policy, or at the classroom level with like our classroom contract or our clear routines around language use and behaviors. Um, and again, we can make that age appropriate. So, you know, we can have rules like respecting other languages and helping and being kind to those who are new to English or who aren't as far along in their learning of English, making it clear it's not acceptable to um, mock or tease someone if they can't pronounce some sounds in English or you know, if they're using unfamiliar sounds in their own language. Um, the other thing that's really important to create is this culture of curiosity. And I think, again, I attended a conference about school leaders for, um, for learning languages yesterday. And this was the thing that just came through again and again, was the way you get kids interested in learning languages is you create that curiosity as early as possible. So this is, making sure students know about the different languages that are spoken in their classroom, generating curiosity about it, um, and, this, uh, and, and, and helping them understand the different ways that languages work. Um, how do you say that in your language? It can be as simple as just sharing translations, and, and we'll talk more about that later. But helping them understand that a different language is more than just different vocabulary with unfamiliar pronunciations. Um, and, you know, that was my experience of learning French at school. I just, it was just learning lists and lists of vocabulary, which I just thought I plugged into a, an English sentence and that was it. And I, I bored me stupid for seven years. Um, and it took me many years to to catch up and, and realize languages were amazing and fascinating and brilliant. But because no one explained to me that, you know, there's grammar, there's different ways of saying metaphors or whatever, all these kind of amazing things that we know about language. Um, our plurilingual learners um, kind of inherently know this stuff. Let's share it, share it with each other. There's also this idea of creating comfort and safety. So normalizing the use of other languages in the classroom. This could be, you know, inviting in um, 
parents to read stories, allowing students to perform songs or poems in their own languages, and just kind of making it just seem like it's a normal thing that happens. That sense of belonging and comfort is going to allow it to happen um, much more naturally. Um, it doesn't mean we can't sometimes have English, our English only times where they're only using English. That's But it's creating that sense that it, they're not going to be punished um, for using English in most situations. And lastly, this is where, again, where translanguaging, I think, as an idea is important. Representation is really important. Make other languages visible and audible in your school. Um, not just the cool kids, so Mandarin, Spanish, Arabic. Let's celebrate all the languages and varieties, you know, Telugu, Twi, Yoruba, Berba, Umbundu, Cantonese, Guarani, Quechua, Nahuatl. And you might say, well, we don't have any of those languages in our school. Um, and I would just say, are you sure? Because it can be a lot of internalized stigma around admitting to using heritage languages that don't have the same status as national or official languages in some contexts. Um, and, you know, be aware that, for example, parents or family members, especially grandparents, they may not be literate in the heritage language that they're using at home. So they may not be able to write um, down um, the language that they're using. Um, also think about language varieties of English, different varieties. So in Singapore, people speak Singlish, um, might be, you know, Nigerian English in Nigeria, regional varieties that get used if you've got children from different parts of English speaking countries. Um, and, and one warning I would say is be really careful with using national flags to represent languages. I know it's really tempting because they're very colorful and it's a very sort of um, visually uh, impressive thing to do. But if we're using national flags, where do our indigenous languages go? Where do our language varieties go? Many languages are spoken across borders and they may not have a single nationality associated with them. Um, think of languages like Kurdish or Quechua. Okay. And before we introduce any translanguaging activities, it's gonna be a good idea to have a discussion about it with your students. So I just wanted to share some of the types of questions you could ask to get your students to start talking about it. And of course they could do this in English or they could do it in their own languages. And of course you could adapt these and simplify them for, for younger children um, and could make them more complex for, for your older students. Okay. Right, we've got half an hour. We'll get into the strategies, I promise. I am gonna get there. So we are going to look at some possible strategies for exploiting students' own languages. It's not meant to be exhaustive. It's kind of a little bit of cherry picking some ideas that I thought might be useful. So I did want to start off by just thinking of translanguaging strategies for teachers. Now, this is only really applicable if you're in a type C context where you have a share a language with the students or you're in a type B context and perhaps you've got home language support from your TAs. I know a lot of... Um, classrooms where that's the case. Um, and these techniques you could teach to your teaching assistants, your bilingual teaching assistants to use with the students. So perhaps the most simple one is what we call sandwiching, um, which is where you insert a word or phrase in the student's own language into what you're saying. We'll give an example in a second. Recasting, where you indicate you've understood what the learner has said in their own language, but you acknowledge them and recast what they've said in English. A mirroring, which is where you draw attention to a mistake um, in English that you know or suspect comes from the student applying aspects of their own language um, and get coming up with an incorrect translation. So this often works with things like false friends. I'll explain what I mean in a moment. So to give you an example of sandwiching, it might be giving an instruction. Okay, group one, say a word you do not understand. Then the teacher repeats a key phrase in their own language. I think it's Malay in this case. And then repeats it again in English, repeats the phrase again in English. And this can be really useful for getting new to English students used to classroom instructions in English. It's relatively unintrusive. Um, and this technique can also be used by your bilingual teaching assistants. It's really important. This is not the same as repeating the instructions word for word in the home language after you finish saying them. It's not the same thing. It's being very purposeful about a particular phrase or a particular word. 
One way to make this particularly impactful is to keep a record of the common instructions and instruction things that you say in class and work through them methodolo methodically. So maybe one week you focus on a particular phrase. Once the students have kind of got that and they can, they're used to hearing it in English, you can then move on to doing it with another phrase and you can gradually tick them off and build up that repertoire of classroom language. Um, kind of sounds very obvious, but it can be really powerful when it's done skillfully. Here's an example of recasting. So the teacher asks the student, have you ever been to England? And the student replies, no, I've never been to, and then they don't know the word, so they use it in their own language, Hungarian in this case. And, and you repeat it. So have you ever been abroad? Have you ever been abroad? Someone's asking, how do you use these strategies if our TAs are not familiar with the child's language themselves? Well, then you don't. You, these are not strategies that are available to you. So you need to uh, we'll look at other strategies that you can that you can use. And here's an example of um, mirroring. So in this case, we've got a text written by a student. Um, in this case, the student's home language is Spanish and the teacher shares that language. So the teacher has offered two possible own language translations for words that they think are mistranslated that aren't aren't correct. Um, so for the word actual, we learned about the actual situation. The teacher's written real, which means like real, um, or en este momento, at this time, currently. Which of these senses are you trying to get across? And notice what this does is it's not providing the correct translation straight away. It's a, the student has to think about, in their own language, which meaning they met, they wanted to use, and then they can figure out what the better English translation is, either by using a dictionary or from their own knowledge or experience. So again, it's this kind of self-directed learning. Okay, as I said, those are mainly if you're a, you know if you share a language, but there are also loads of things we can do if you do not share language with your learners. So one of the this, this set of activities are all related to sort of making connections and building identity in your classroom, building linguistic identity. Um, one of the most important techniques we can use, and you may well do this already in different ways, is own language moments. And that means for a defined period of time, the students can talk about whatever they want in their own language. And the idea is that this is giving them a kind of brain break, okay? Um, it's letting them, um, it's let, it's giving them a break from that cognitive uh, demand of operating in a second language, which especially when learners are newer to English is really, you know, challenging. Um, now, if you have students who don't share a language, if you're in a, a type A classroom, you could do this simply by playing a song, doing some physical exercise, you know, break anything to break up that mental load of concentrating in a second language can really be beneficial. Um, of course, the own language moment could also be task related. We can link it into a task. If you have learners, for example, who are share who share home languages, um, they could work together to discuss um, before they do a task in English, like a speaking task or a writing task. Okay, let's have a think pair share in in home language. Um, you could also do it during a task, especially if you sense that the level of work the students are producing isn't the required level. Okay, let's stop that. Talk about it in your own language for a little bit. Let's get some more ideas and then we'll go back to the English. And of course, it could also be used following a task as a reflection or a plenary feedback in, in the own language. Um, again, because the quality of responses you get through doing that can often be much richer. So obviously with the plenary feedback, that's most useful in a B or C classroom, but it could also be done um, with A if you ask students to make notes themselves and then share them, uh, make notes in their own language, and then but then share them in English if they're able to. With our younger learners, a really great way of building that sense of belonging and identities, bringing in own language songs and stories into the classroom. Um, a really nice little thing I think works well at primary level, probably at secondary level, there's not really space for it, but it's providing children with a simple dialogue in English. It could be as simple as hello, hello, or what's your name? My name is. And um, in our 
type A classrooms where they all have different languages, make sure they're in small groups and um, they teach each other uh, this phrase in their own language. And it might seem not related to what's happening in the classroom, but what you'll find is that it really energizes the children. It makes them really curious about each other's language and it, it facilitates that other there's other types of translanguaging that you might be introducing later down the line. We've mentioned this a little bit already, but allowing students to put own language annotations or illustrations when they're when they're doing writing tasks. So maybe they're writing their paragraph in English, but they might want to make little notes with their own language to you know help them memorize meanings of words or just to note down thoughts that they've got about the topic or whatever it might be. With older students, a secondary, you know, that old own language research, giving them time to go away and research something in their own language if, if that's what they're more comfortable doing, and then bringing back and sharing with English. Okay. So another thing that weirdly translanguaging is brilliant at, is really useful for, is building vocabulary in English. This might seem a bit counterintuitive, um, but, you know, this is an important point to make to, say, for example, parents uh, who are um, resistant to the idea of using home languages in the classroom. Well, actually, translanguaging can really, really help strengthen children's English. And what I mean is um, you can do activities like this. So choosing new words to translate into English. So you can ask learners to find a text in their own language on a topic. Um, now, this could be done by the learner themselves, or you could provide the text, depending on your situation. So, you know, maybe they go away and find a newspaper article in their own language about the topic that you're studying. And then from that text in their own language, they can choose four to seven words or phrases from the text that they don't know how to say in English. And then they just go away. They use an online dictionary or whatever their preferred method is to find the translations. Um, and perhaps you can share those words, those translated words on a shared document or something like a Padlet or a Quizlet. And that can act as a kind of shared class vocabulary resource for when you start studying the topic. Um, learners can also brainstorm vocabulary they think will appear in a text or a topic in their first languages. Again, this pre this preparation is really important for multilingual learners, just getting them to think about it. Um, engaging the schemata is the technical <laughs> term, um, but they can do that in their home languages and then translate them into English. And again, the reason for doing that is you usually get way more ideas, you get way more vocabulary items doing it like this than just getting them to do it in English. But of course, experiment. If 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 it's not working in your classroom, then then don't don't use it. And these two, I'm going to talk about in a bit more depth. But these are quite powerful tools, and if you can get your students kind of used to doing these activities, um, you're really going to set them up for success, uh, especially later in secondary. So, cross-checking definitions is simply using a dictionary to check if they've got the right translation. Um, so doing more than one vocabulary check. Uh, what I mean by that is, let's say we've got a sentence. So our student, I'm using Spanish again because it's a language I've got a little bit of familiarity with. Um, they have this student uh, is a Spanish speaker. They have this student, they have this sentence in their head and they want to translate it into English, um, but they don't know the word traje. So they do what we'd all probably do in that situation. Go on Google Translate. Okay, traje means suit. And they come up with the following in English. Now, of course, if you're a proficient user of English, you probably go, mm, that doesn't look quite right, does it? Children dressed in national suits. A suit in English is fairly specific in meaning, and it's just the suit and tie and the shirt. Um, uh, this isn't quite the right translation. So then you might ask the child to cross-check this word. So the child then looks up uh, a Spanish English dictionary 
don't use Google Translate for this because Google Translate tends to just give single word answers. It's not very detailed and it also doesn't give sample sentences often. So choose a bilingual dictionary. I went on SpanishDict.com and if you look up the word traje, it gives you these four different possible translations into English with example sentences. So then the student can read the sentences and decide which one they think would be the better translation. Maybe they come up with a sentence like that. And actually, of course, this could lead to a discussion around, well, which words could we use? Which words can't we use? Why? Um, children dressed in national garb. Is garb the best word? Is it, it sounds a bit more informal. Maybe dress would be better for a written context. You know, it can lead to all these kind of discussions. If you're going to do this as a process, teach it, do it as a class um, activity first, I think, and then um, once the students are used to it, you can just ask them to cross-check things. Okay, cross-check. <laughs> it's also a really useful technique because it highlights the importance of translating something in context in a sentence rather than just relying on individual words. So again, this kind of knowledge is really important for our multilingual learners. Um, it can also lead to things like you can get them to experiment with different translation tools, with different with with sentences, which which translation tools work the best for your language. Um, and again, if you've got a multilingual class, group A class, and you can't check on the reliability of the translations because you don't speak the languages yourself, getting them to figure out which ones seem to work the best for them is is really important um, learning skill. Obviously, you know this is more. I'm talking more for like older students, more independent learners. And this is this idea of building um, vocabulary via using uh, the same word in English, but across different senses with different meanings, and then getting them to translate it into their own language. So I think using tier two words, which are the academic words that appear across the curriculum, can be really helpful. So I've got the word absorb. I went to the website youglish.com which is really great because it just gives you, um, you can type in any word and it'll just give you hundreds of clips that use that word. And I got a bunch of samples from different kind of vaguely academic contexts. Youglish only uses like TED talks or academic videos. It doesn't use like um, anything inappropriate. So it's safe for children to use. Um, and the children translate these sentences back into their own languages. Um, and of course, what that is really good for is helping them realize that, you know, the same word in English can be translated into two or three or four different words in their own language. Um, or, or maybe not, you know, but again, it's building that awareness. Um, you can also do this if you're in a type B or C class, you can reverse this. So you could give them the word in their own language. They have to write as many different ver um, sentences using that word in their own language um, with different senses, and then they can translate them back into English. Again, making them aware of those differences. So we've spoken already about a couple of translation things, and I'm going to touch on a few um, useful translation activities that we can use. Now, translation is traditionally seen as something that um, we don't want in our language classrooms. Um, it's sort of old fashioned, but again, I think when it's used carefully, it can be really, really uh, powerful. Um, we're running a bit short on time, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but I do recommend looking at the Philip Kerr book that I've talked about here if you want to find out more. Um, one thing can be, uh, so one technique is identifying tricky translations. This is where you ask students to look at a text in their own language and they identify the bits in that text that they would find difficult to, um, sorry, this is where you give them a text in English and they identify the bits in English that they would find difficult to translate into their own language. Um, could be for whatever reason, maybe they don't know the vocabulary, maybe the uh, you know the grammar structure is very different. And then they can compare with partners and they can sort of figure out together how they would translate it into English. And again, it's re it works really well when you've got students with different languages um, as, and it can work equally well with students who share a language. They do need to have some ability to discuss. So again, it's more of a secondary. Um, translating rubrics or success criteria, again, it helps with that clarity of understanding. And another really powerful tool is reverse translation. Um, what I mean by reverse translation is 
having a text in English, they put it into their own language. You take away the original text in English, they translate it back into the English language, and then they can compare it with the original. So just to give a single word example, we've got the word English and a translation in a foreign language, in this case, Czech, and then the, the child might translate that back into English. Now, of course, you'll notice they've maybe made a little mistake because they've forgotten to capitalize the E because that's not how it works in their own language. So then we can bring back the original and they can go, ah, there's a difference. Ah, yeah, I forgot to do the capital letter. That's a very simplified way of doing it. Um, again, we'll, I won't dwell on this too much because we're running out of time, but a really useful way you can do this reverse translation is for model exam answers. Works really well for that. So here's a science IGCSE question. You provide the ch children with the English model answer. You might want to point out the really useful phrases, the structures that are helpful. Give them a translation in their own language. ChatGPT is really helpful for this, um, especially if you've got lots of different languages in your classroom. You can just simply give them the sample answer. ChatGPT, please translate th this into list all the languages you've got in your classroom. The translation doesn't have to be perfect. It's not really the point. As long as it's broadly factually correct, it can work. Then the child translates this back. And as you notice, there might be a few mistakes in there in terms of grammar, but actually the content in there is really good. Um, and then they can compare it and then they can, that's the comparing bit is where they do the learning. So which version is better, the original or your version? Um, if it, if is your version acceptable, would it get the marks? If yes, great. If no, how could you improve it? And again, once you've introduced this concept, it's very powerful. You can do it again and again, and students get used to uh, um, using their own languages in this way to really develop their English. All right, so for the last five minutes, I'm gonna look at some examples. So how do we bring these ideas we've talked about and what might they look like in the different types of classroom that we've talked about? So let's just first give some uh, context. So we've got, let's imagine we've got a type A classroom. This is a school in Dubai based near multinational company headquarters. And there are students from all across the globe, um, from first language English speakers to speakers of all kinds of languages. Um, the school operates a British curriculum and the staff are mainly recruited from English speaking countries. Type B, um, this is our, this is an international school in Bangkok. Um, the vast majority of pupils are Thai nationals. So Thai is the shared language among the pupils, but the teaching staff are largely recruited from overseas. Um, and the majority of them don't use Thai um, or don't use it fluently. Um, however, the majority of classes will have Thai um, teaching assistants in them to help providing language support. And our type C classroom is in um, India in Kolkata. All the students are from the local population and they all share uh, at least one language, um, Bengali, which is the main language in that part of India. Um, however, the majority of the teaching staff as well are from that local community and they also speak Bengali as their first language, even though English is the main language of the school. So let's go into our Abu Dhabi school. Um, and I'm going to use a primary example for this one. Imagine we've got a year one class. The topic is fairy tales. Um, and the first thing this, the teacher does is with the school, um, they get the, <clears throat> they ask the parents to share fairy tales from their own cultures or in their own languages um, and bring those into school as books if they have them. Um, and they also invite each day of the week a parent to come in and read a story in their own language. Um, the teacher in this case is uh, from Scotland and they don't speak another language well enough to model this themselves, but they do it by modeling. Um, they tell a, a Scottish folk tale and they use kind of Scottish dialect words and they teach the children those. So they kind of do it, they come at it from that angle as well. The children love hearing these stories and it's also an opportunity for the children whose language it is 
um, on each day to try and explain the story in English. For the children who are new to English, they can still use pictures, they can still use mimes. Um, you know, you'd be amazed how much children love listening to stories in whatever language, especially as long as there's pictures or some kind of physical aspect to it. So the teacher then um, sends copies of the fairy tales in ink that they've been studying in class in English in picture form. They send them home, the storyboard, and the children's homework is to tell the story to a family member in their own language. So again, all we're doing is reinforcing the children's understanding of the story, and it helps them build their vocabulary in both languages, because maybe they don't know what the word beanstalk is <laughs> in their own language. And anyway, so it can it can build both languages at the same time. Um, and back in the class, the teachers discovered that after the own language stories, the children's curiosity about each other's languages has increased. Um, and she notices some of them even sharing phrases, you know, usually the silly or rude ones with each other during playtime. And so she implements a learn my language section each week um, where she writes a simple conversation and the students kind of teach each other that, that language. And, you know, the student notices that the um, amount of use of other languages in the classroom is increasing and there's more kind of spontaneous use uh, because of this kind of acceptance of using all languages and um, and she's planning to do um, future language weeks using songs or poems later in the term to ensure all children get a chance to showcase their own languages all right with our school in bangkok we're going to look at a secondary um, context the subject is history. Um, so the topic is European imperialism for an IGCSE exam. Um, and the students are given a case study of a particular European colony from a list and they research it in their own language um, to build vocabulary. As part of this task, they choose some words and phrases from Thai connected to the topic they didn't know how to say in English and they translate them and they share them um, on a Google Doc which is like a glossary for the um, access of glossary. And so they're shared the, the Thai translations with the English words, which can be referred to by everyone. Um, and in class, the teacher presents a model paragraph in English that are comparing two of the case studies. And they discuss the model and the teacher highlights the key language, especially the kind of comparing language. And then the teacher who doesn't speak Thai provides a translated version in Thai Again, maybe they use ChatGPT. Maybe they get the TA just to check that it's factually correct. And the, and the students work in pairs to translate the Thai version back into English. And then they compare their answers with the original model. Um, the students are then given two case studies um, and they have own language planning time and access to the shared glossary they created earlier to plan their own text their own comparison text and then they can write the text under exam conditions in class but the teacher might allow them to annotate the text in Thai if they want to um, again just so they can uh, um, quickly and easily make notes of things in their own language if they're more comfortable doing that and for homework finally the students are, have to create a video summarizing their text um, and they're allowed to use translanguaging during the recordings of those videos. So if they don't know the exact word in English, they can just say it in Thai, and that just helps make it more fluid um, and, and easier to do, and it stops that kind of perfectionism the students can fall into. And again, those summaries can then be shared late and, uh, and uh, used as revision guides later. All right. Um, I'm not gonna talk through the um, Type C example, um, I think, I think there was fewer people in a type C school, but um, I'm going to move on because we've almost we're almost out of time. But I just wanted to say that I'll share with you this quote, um, and just to say that I think it's potentially quite a daring and disruptive dance dance to take doing translanguaging. So do think about what are the power structures and ideologies at play in your school. Um, um, before embarking on your translanguaging journey. And you may want to think of some of these questions when you're doing it that might help you uh, find your way. And I don't think there's any easy answers to 
any of these questions necessarily, but it's definitely one of those where you can um, can go away and you can experiment. Okay, so well, that's all for me. I don't know if we have any questions. I think the time is up. But, um, we will um, share all the references and things with you um, at the end of the webinar by email. Thank you. Lovely. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, there were no questions that came in really during, or there was one that we've managed to reply to. I see um, if you've got any questions following the webinar, feel free to email us and we'll get back to you. Um, you can reply to the email address, I think, that the post-webinar email will come from. Well, thank you very much for uh, attending today's webinar. Uh, before we go, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we've got two online courses coming up in November. One is on adaptive teaching and the other one is a course for teaching assistants. You can find all the details on our website. And our next free webinar has also been published. It will be running on the 28th of November and we'll hear from two international schools about how they uh, conduct assessment of EA learners and they will share their experiences around using the Bell Foundation's um, assessment framework for schools. So if you're interested, uh, please have a look at our website and uh, feel free to register. Um, and also, if you just want to be emailed about any new training opportunities or webinars as they come up, feel free to sign up to our newsletter as well. As I said at the start, we will send you an email with a recording of this webinar and a link to all the resources that Tom has mentioned or is just showing you. Um, the email should come within the next 48 hours, so please keep an eye out. And thank you very much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again. Indeed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. <laughs>